architectural river cruise in Chicago. So we have the ferry right here. It was raining for a while, but we were praying for it not to rain, so it's not raining anymore. So yeah, um, we're very excited, and the river looks really cool. It's double, double deck, so that's going to be pretty cool. We're going to sit on the top, and um, it'll be a really cool day cruise. We haven't done this in a few years. The water seems very nice. So it's going to be about a one-hour trip, and it's just going to be a cruise around the entire downtown of Chicago. So we'll just be like touring Chicago, except on. So it rained and they're being so courteous and they're actually wiping the seats down. So that's a really great thing. I was really scared that I would have to wet my pants, but um, that won't happen. So be careful on the decks. If it does begin to rain, we have more seating downstairs. Uh, so feel free to move downstairs, stairway in the back of the boat. And uh, be careful going down the stairs. But hopefully we'll have a dry couple hours here. Hello. Hi there. Welcome aboard. Hello. Hello. Hey, my name is William. I'm going to be your docent, your tour guide over these uh, next uh, moments here on the Chicago River. Uh, while we're getting underway, Captain John, he needs to let me have you know a couple things about safety. Uh, you are aboard Evening Star. Evening Star is a U.S. Coast Guard certified passenger vessel. This means we have all the necessary life-saving equipment aboard in the event of an unlikely emergency. Primarily that means life jackets. They're the wooden top deck boxes that run along the perimeter of the boat. Uh, we only need them in case of emergency and so far zero to zero. So it's just good to know where they are. Uh, we got a little bit of rain. Uh, so like Kevin John said, please do be careful when you're walking around the boat using handrails on the stairs. There are stairs at the back of the boat. They lead down to the lower level. Some additional seating down there. The restrooms are on the starboard, the right hand side of the vessel as you're facing forward. And you will also find Jake, the ship's bartender. It's after 9 a.m. in the city of Chicago, so the bar is open. Uh, he has hot and cold drinks, alcoholic and non, so uh, feel free to visit him uh, at any time uh, throughout. Again, just be careful when moving about the boat. Uh, you know, even on a dry day, you're on a moving boat, it's just always good to remember that your body moves differently when you do so. Uh, also, just while we're underway, a couple things to keep in mind. No kneeling or standing on any of the benches. Please use this wooden handrail as a perimeter of the vessel. Keep everything inside. It's just much easier to bring everybody back safely that way. You'll also see the Michigan Avenue Bridge here in front of us. Uh, we have some low-lying bridges, especially some of the uh, two-level ones. Please resist the strange human urge to touch a sharp and rusty bridge. It has worked out zero times for those who've attempted it. So again, it's easier to bring everybody out safely if you keep everything inside the boat uh, at all times. Uh, also, just we're living...
telling you, it's a take out your bed and find flats. Try to find a mistake. He was also a professor here in the city. One of his students uh, disagreed with him, I think. One of his students designed these corn cob towers next door. Marina City by Bertrand Goldberg. Definitely uh, going the opposite way in terms of uh, no right angles in his designs. He didn't like that. Uh, his uh, He's kind of known for saying that he, he liked being out in nature. He never saw right angles naturally in the natural world, so why would I want my architecture to be all right angles? Eventually coming up with this kind of curved concrete aesthetic he's known for. Also a bit of a city within a city. A bit of a rarity, a place where you could park your boat back in the 60s underneath your car, under your condo. Bowling alley, movie theater, but fitness center, shops, restaurants, offices, grocery store, ice skating rink, everything inside. Now it's pretty common to have all that amenity, rich living. Really quickly though, I want to bounce across the river to 55 West Wacker. A sharp left as we come underneath, it kind of sounds like it looks. Brutalism. It comes from the French beton brew, which means raw concrete. And that was the idea, lucky masses of it. Uh, if you owned a bank or an insurance company, maybe a law firm back then, a sign of strength and security. But for uh, maintenance purposes and costs, and for the fact that most people think it's ugly, you just don't see a lot of it anymore. But uh, in the architectural world, there's still quite a bit of love as we get less and less of it. <laughs> to the right, coming up, beautifully maintained, 1914, this red bricked clock tower building. This is the Reed Murdoch Center, it's from 1914 school, largely, uh, and it's a uh, design which Frank Lloyd Wright made famous, of course, with his homes. I like to point out its asymmetry, though. It's pretty simple. There are six bays of windows on the right, only five on the left. Symmetry is a principal element of design. One of the most famous symmetric faces in the world, one William Bradley Pitts. Symmetry is known for being attractive, so it was built with six and six until they widened this bridge in 1928. They needed more room a base, a shaft, and a capital. Merchandise mark here. It's from 1930. Art Deco is the style. Limestone siding, vertical lines, dark setbacks. We'll see a lot of this. The heads facing away from us is what I get asked about. Those are the merchant princes. The mark was built for Marshall Field as a department store warehouse. He's up there, those heads. Uh, Montgomery Ward, Wanamaker, Sears. The confluence of the river. This is the first thing I want to say. We're going to talk about this brand new building because it was practically in the ground the last time I saw it. But first, if you're looking at a blue glass building, it didn't exist five years ago when I started on the river. That building, this new construction, that building, that building, that building, the river walk, none of it was here five years ago. So a big changing point at what used to be our city center back when we were just a small little town. But this is obviously where most people's attention is going today, and it's going to be the new tallest building at Wolf Point. Uh, 60 stories tall, a new office building, uh, Salesforce, expanding their uh, workforce here in the Midwest. But most people's eyes are naturally drawn to these two. A uh, brand new sculpture uh, from last year by Santiago Calatrava in front of River Point, which is really one of my favorites. You got these inverted parabolas. Some people call it the Hot Pocket Building, but I don't care. I still like it. I think it looks nice. Understandably, though, most people's eyes are drawn to this guy here to our right. Uh, 150 North Riverside Plaza. This is also from 2017. It only utilizes 20% of its lot area. So my favorite part, look up. Into our reflection. That's us, right there. That is easily my favorite part of this design. Yeah, sure, give yourself a wave. That's good, I like that. We'll talk a little bit more about some of its engineering and why it stays up so well on our way back up. But that's where we're going to go to the left. Finished up in the last moments of 2020, we have a brand new Blue Glass office building here to our left. This is for Bank of America, 110 North Blacker. 
uh, the same architect behind the building we just talked about to the river, right? A lot of times we're drawn to the crowns of buildings. As of late, a lot of these new office buildings invite your eye to the river or street level. Here you got these uh, kind of inverted trusses, more or less. I think they kind of look like uh, pitchforks or tridents. Uh, I think this is an, another great one where uh, everybody sees things a little bit differently. They're also both from 1929, so they've known each other for a while. To the right, you have this beautiful Riverside Plaza, and to the left, not exactly. But they're built in the same year, so one of them had to be strange. The strange one was actually the Riverside Plaza, especially today, and especially if it's your first time in your life. Uh, starting off in the 1960s, you have black box modernism, kind of in its heyday. In the 60s, uh, some people refer to it as the Mad Men era of architecture nowadays. It's a good kind of uh, jumping off point if you're familiar. Following these van der Rohe's less is more form follows function approach. But it is worth noting now in the 70s, you get a white box, which is different. Which I can a box that Mies van der Rohe's influence reaching the international stage. Then we go uh, in the 80s, curving green glass, a bit of contextualism. Except rather than tipping its cap to the height of another building, the curve and color here acknowledge the river with its upcoming curve and color. Where international style could be built anywhere, contextualism encourages that individuality. Then we're going to go left to a, a building I didn't talk about, and then about six years ago, five, five, or actually right when I started here, uh, they uh, had this mural done. I imagine the owner sat down with the artist at some point saying, listen, uh, William isn't talking about us on his new tour. Uh, we got to shake things up, obviously. Uh, we need something that's going to put us back on the map. Which is a way of saying, this is a giant you are here map painted in the building. The red rectangle is this building. The rest of it is the street under the top of Gotham City Bank was filmed here. Back when this building was vacant. For 20 years. This actually was our old post office in the 20s. We expanded it in the 30s. We move out in 1996. And this redevelopment into built two brand new rental buildings. Uh, they're, I think, just about to break ground on a third one, which will be taller than these two. This Riverwalk was finished up last year. And it, it really is another example of how the city and the river's relationship has changed recently. The idea of building a river walk, a private entity investing money to get you closer to what was traditionally our sewer. It's still a new idea, right? This is the first kind of, uh, of its kind here on the South Branch, and I think they've done a really lovely job uh, with it as they continue. I think we have three more buildings planned here over uh, the next place is uh, the Reed Echelon. Kind of sound like fragrances. Then let's go to this guy. Anybody recognizing Curve Concrete? Kind of a Jetsons residence. Uh, how all these new uh, luxury rentals in most major cities, they're with, uh, are referred to as amenity rich. Listen, right? They give you a rooftop garden, pool, fitness center, chef's kitchens, movie rooms, uh, coffee shops, restaurants. That's a big selling point, more than the unit homes today. And Bertrand Goldberg kind of had his finger on the pulse about that. In fact, a lot of recent city planning, uh, kind of, uh, I guess, research train station, uh, this is another one of those ones where every time I come back, every season I'm off, I'm like, is this going to be here? It, it really has kind of had uh, an interesting uh, history here. It was built back uh, in the 30s. Uh, hasn't been used in uh, about 10, 15 years. They phased it out even before they vacated it. Uh, but really, two things. I think it's a cool kind of marker of an industrial past, right? Where we have river walks here in the South Branch, it's good to remember that this is really near. Uh, the land of the West is calling this parcel land 78. There are currently 77 neighborhoods in the city. And as you looking north from our South Branch, I think this was one of my favorites just because it is, I think, a uniquely Chicago photo for a number of reasons that we'll get into. Uh, some of the other uh, photo ops are a little bit maybe more picturesque, but I think this one's pretty in a really lovely way. So feel free to grab a photo, just make sure you know the person behind you can do the same thing. Be a good neighbor and all that. And we're going to dive into uh, these tall buildings in front of us for important and uh, maybe obvious reasons. Uh, uh, so the reasons we've talked about were in an important part of the city. Our industrial past and a lot of... Uh, I see a lot of you taking photos, so feel free to grab a photo to our left. 
nobody ever does, that's okay. Uh, in the distance, you'll find a communications tower. Uh, you'll see a red-topped communications tower. We can actually pinpoint with a pretty good degree of certainty, considering the times. That is where the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 began, at the O'Leary Farm. It's my job, people shouting cow at me. It's fine, you got it. <laughs> The story goes like this. Let's get all on the same page. Uh, Sunday, October 8th of 1871, this is Catherine O'Leary. She leaves a kerosene lantern in her barn over on DeCoven Street, and that is when her cow, right, her cow Daisy, then kicks that kerosene lantern into the hay, starting it, the barn, and eventually the city ablaze. It's important to me that you know, if you didn't know this story, it is a very famous story. I don't say this to leave you out. I mean, it is a famous story, one of the most famous in the world. It wasn't the cow because the guy who wrote it said, hey, I made that up. It's still largely a mystery. We don't know. We don't know how the fire started. And more safe city, so often uh, city planning, kind of beauty and safety go hand in hand. Things that we enjoy today just simply wouldn't be possible without the fire providing a clean that slate. I think about that we enjoyed today, uh, because of that plan, the river walk, uh, our park system, uh, diagonal streets. To nice way, tuck away garbage before pickup. You would be hopscotching garbage bags on the sidewalks of Chicago without the fire. All of it. Hello. Let's go to the far right. We're gonna go to these two in front of us. 1930, a statue on top of the Chicago Board of Trade. A very tall art deco building for its time. Ceres is the Roman goddess of the harvest, as the Board of Trade was an agricultural commodities exchange, but uh, it's been Wayne Enterprises and the Batman Begins, a whole bunch of stuff, I think, uh, really draws filmmakers in that statue, kind of mystery there. Which brings us to these two tall buildings. I call them the king and queen chess pieces of our skyline. First up is 311 South Wacker from 1990, pretty pink. Uh, it kind of has a, a multitude in it, but honestly probably pays second fiddle to what is the tallest in the city. 1,451 feet tall, 110 stories, 100 elevators, over 16,000 windows, the Sears Tower. Maybe the lowest, but we're going to call it the Sears Tower. 1974, built for Sears Roebuck as its international headquarters tallest building in the world for 24 years and still the tallest in Chicago. To have seen parts of uh, design along the river, the glass of Gateway Center 4. Most people don't know, if you look closer, each pane of glass is gently pinched in each corner. It's convex, curved bubble glass. Gets its nickname from bubble wrap. Where you really see it though, I think, is when you look into the reflection and follow it for a moment. The curve. The color, the reflection, all bring you back to the river, its neighbor. Looks a little bit less like you're looking under the reflection of the building and a little more like water, hiding in plain sight. Back to the left, through the bridge, if you really prefer, to the Sears, and it's 110 stories. Off the 103rd floor, uh, you'll see some glass. Oh, they're, put, they're punched in today. They're renovating the observatory. Uh, at the Sky Deck. Don't worry, there is one that is open in Chicago that I'll show you a little bit later on if that's your deal, if you dig that, but uh, let's just push push back to when I can actually show you. Every part of the base of the building extends all the way to the top. One of the hardest parts about talking about the Sears and its importance and its brilliance is that it's simple. It's called a bundled tube system, which is a way of tapering a design. I know, this all sounds enthralling. Think about it this way, though. If you hold a long piece of straw out in the wind, it's going to get blown over. If you bundle a bunch of straw together, the tallest one's in the middle, it's less likely to get blown over. That is the idea that makes the Sears Tower the tallest building in the world. And it's not, it's not complicated. It's not. That's what's frustrating about it. It's a simple way that shapes the skyscraper game. Uh, we also call it the Sears. It's called the Willis Tower today, uh, legally. Naming rights have actually become a very common thing, stadiums especially, in the last five years. It's somebody paid to have the building named. The Willis Insurance, they're in the building. I've had some of their employees in the 90s. By its office towers. 
serrated corners. It's an ink for this and everything, like a serrated knife. More practically though, there was one thing everybody wanted, especially if you worked in the financial industry in the 80s. The way you had made it is if you had a get with its paws coming out. In the early 20s, King Tutankhamun's tomb was unearthed. In Egypt made worldwide news, impacted Art Deco in a really profound way. Kind of an Egyptian revivalism. Very common. Want to put the theater masks on the theater building. Leave us alone. Meantime, we're going to go to the earlier iteration from the same architects, sketch partners, here at 110 North Wacker. Because there's something we can't see inside the top of the building playing an important role. 160,000 gallons worth of water tanks were installed here. It's what's called a tune slash damper. When they were running wind tests on a model, they found the top of the building would begin to sway and vibrate on a windy day, giving a tummy ache to the office workers. Motion sickness. So, on a windy day, the tanks in the building will fill partially, not fully, with water. So that if the building is pushed in one direction by Chicago's notable winds, the tanks will go with the building. They're fixed to the building. The water in the tanks is not instead sloshing and encouraging the building to its upright position, reducing vibration. So far, the largest of its kind in the world. In front of us, the Lake Street Bridge stands out. It's one of my favorite bridges from 1916. Uh, we should probably talk about all these bridges we keep passing underneath. We're known for them. They're all different in their designs, so you hey. can find your favorite over uh, 80 years of architectural history. More of this type of movable bridge than any other city on the planet. bridges, but a shorthand Chicago bridge will do. Since the train there took a little bit of our time, we'll talk more about uh, these bridges near the lake. In the meantime, a different view of that massive merchandise mart in front of us, and it's 4.2 million square feet. This building had its own zip code for a while. It takes up two city blocks, 25 stories. It is massive. Uh, it's really well maintained over the years. It's an it's office building. building. Really one of the first buildings to honor the river in its design. Contextualism tying in. Matching Wacker Drive and the river's curve. Beautiful reflections, but famous where Ferris Bueller's dad worked in the film Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Years ago, 